In midsummer 1967, an unforgettable event happened that will forever be etched in our memories. Six young men decided to explore a part of the Mossdale Cave system, 1.8 miles below the surface, that no one has seen before. They were crawling through tunnels and tiny gaps between rocks, trying to see how deep they could get without knowing what to expect. Mossdale Caverns, situated in the Yorkshire Dales, England, is a cave system located approximately three miles north of Grassington and to the east of Conestone. Positioned at an elevation of 1,394 feet on the eastern side of Wharfdale, the caverns stretch southeast beneath Grassington Moor. Discovered in 1941, these caverns are not your average cave exploration. A round trip to the far end can take anywhere from 8 to 10 hours. However, the allure of Mossdale Caverns comes with a serious caveat. It's considered a dangerous cave network. Its reputation is worrisome due to the constant threat of complete flooding and the challenging passages that require crawling or wading through neck-deep water. Mossdale Caverns are like a natural wonder, two caves in one. You enter through a tight opening, and inside there are hidden passages that twist and turn for nearly seven miles underground. Some of these passages are so narrow, only inches in height. The stream that goes into the cave vanishes near the entrance, reappearing five miles away, much lower, and strangely, 18 days later, at a place called Black Keld, near the River Wharf. The unknown cave and the path between those two points could be one of the deepest and longest in Britain, making it quite a mystery. Some people are obsessed with uncovering this missing link, similar to the quest for the fabled Lost Ark. On Saturday, June 24th, at around 2 p.m., a group of 10 cave explorers ventured into the system. This diverse bunch, mostly in their early 20s, gathered spontaneously from three different caving clubs. Only two of them had previous experience in Mossdale, 26-year-old Dave Adamson, the oldest and the leader, and his 24-year-old friend, Jeff Burrow, recently married, both from Leeds University. The Bolton-based Happy Wanderers Club contributed John Ogden, Jim Cunningham, and John Shepard, all 21 years old. The remaining members were from the Bradford Pothole Club, Colin Vickers, 23, Bill Frakes, 19, both skilled cavers, and Michael Ryan, 17, a beginner with promise. Alongside the men were Colette Lord, 19, joining the Bolton Trio for a unique day out, and Morag Forbes, 22, set to marry Dave the following month. Dave and Jeff planned to clear the blocked mini cow passage, with the others helping out by carrying gear and adding Mossdale to their list of conquered caves. The weather was initially good, but the forecast predicted possible thunderstorms. Jim and John privately decided it was too risky for them, but Dave, confident in his knowledge of the cave, reassured them. Not wanting to admit their concerns, they were stuck until the two women provided an excuse. Although they were not experienced cavers, they were up for an easy underground adventure. Jim and John offered to accompany them, volunteering if Dave could spare them. No one remained above ground because there was no telephone communication, and the underground cable to Rough Chamber was known to be damaged in multiple spots. Although there had been some rain in the Grassington area in the preceding days, the moor seemed dry, and the amount of water entering the cave was less than usual. The weather forecast for the north indicated bright periods and a chance of thunder showers. Once inside the cave, the group immediately split into two. Six men led by Dave Adamson, Jeff Burrow, Bill Frakes, John Ogden, Michael Ryan, and Colin Vickers moved ahead. They were well-equipped and experienced, intending to explore the far reaches of the high-level mud caverns or investigate further for a passage through the stream-end cavern boulder choke. The remaining four cavers, James Cunningham, Morag Forbes, Colette Lord, and John Shepard, opted for a sightseeing trip, reaching Rough Chamber and returning to the surface around 5 p.m. Light rain had started and the sky was overcast, but nothing seemed alarming. The four cavers went back to their base at Hal Gill Nick's shooting hut, changed, and had a meal. With no apparent reason to worry, three of them left for Ingleton, 
leaving Morak at the hut. As light rain persisted around 7.30 p.m., Morak returned to the scar, finding little change in the water conditions. She then walked back to the shooting hut, about a half-hour journey over the moor. Shortly after, the rain intensified, and growing concerned for the safety of the underground party, she went back to the scar, arriving around 9 p.m. Mossdale Beck had swollen to flood levels, creating a large lake in front of the scar. The entrance was already submerged. Recognizing the dire situation, Morak ran about three quarters of a mile to Gill House Farm for help, but it was deserted. She then went on to Yarnbury, another one and a half miles, where she found Mr. Riley. He drove her to call for assistance from rescue organizations. The plea for help reached the Upper Wharfdale Fell Rescue Team at 11.10 p.m. They promptly sent a team to the SCAR, alerted the CRO for standby, and requested fire brigade personnel and pumps. The initial team from Upper Wharfdale reached the SCAR at 1.15 a.m. on Sunday, June 25th, discovering severe conditions with the new entrance submerged under four feet of water. Around 2 a.m., efforts to divert the stream had begun. The Settle Ingleton team of CRO was mobilized, along with as many members of the Leeds University Club as could be located. A makeshift dam was built around the restricted new entrance, allowing a group from the Wharfdale team to reach the assembly hall inside the cave by 2.25 a.m. However, they discovered that the usually limited airspace beyond Blackpool Sands the only way further into the cave was completely submerged and impassable. Using diving equipment at this point would have been both ineffective and risky, so further progress was ruled out until the water level could be sufficiently reduced. During this period, the fire brigade set up several portable pumps along the beck, directing a flow of water past the scar and down to the sinks of Conestone Moor. By 3.30 a.m., around 8 to 12 of these pumps were in operation, but it was evident that this endeavor had minimal impacts on water levels, despite the rain having ceased shortly after midnight. By about 5 a.m., the decision was made that the only viable solution was to secure heavy digging equipment and redirect the entire Mossdale Beck past the scar. Achieving this required digging a trench approximately 390 feet long, and six to eight feet deep, along with constructing a substantial dam to reroute the beck away from the sinks at the base of the scar. At around 8 a.m. on Sunday, the water level in the beck seemed to have dropped slightly, and a telephone link was set up between the entrance and the assembly hall inside the cave. It became apparent that it was now feasible to traverse the sections of the cave that were previously submerged, namely the drown or glories and the swim and reach as far as the rough chamber. There was optimism that the missing party might have been stuck in this higher part of the system and possibly found refuge from the flood in one of the Avons or in Boulder Hall itself. However, despite the search, there was no sign of the missing party. At rough chamber, a strong stream was still flowing down the usually dry, rough passage. This occurs when the limited sump in siphon passage can't handle the full mainstream flow, causing water to back up and flow through the straightway to rough chamber, and then on through rough passage to knee wrecker junction. From there, it divides, flowing partly down the marathon and partly into knee wrecker. Given this, it was deemed impractical to proceed further through the narrow passages until the water flow could be reduced and the dam, which was then being built, became operational. During this period, it became evident to those familiar with the cave that the chances of the missing men surviving were slim. The cave showed signs of extremely severe flood, and there were only a very few places beyond Rough Chamber where a party could potentially be safe, but uncertainty surrounded these locations. Although a well-equipped and experienced group, like the one in question, could likely endure a flood for 12 to 24 hours and then find their way out of the cave independently, there was no indication of the missing men by midday, despite the beck's reduced flow into the cave. Finally, the water diversion and dam were operational and believed to be sufficient to shield underground parties from additional flooding. 
At 12.40 p.m., a team of six was sent in to explore the Marathon Passage, supported by another group of six entering the cave at 1.25 p.m. The telephone line to Rough Chamber was now working somewhat unreliable, and there was a forecast of more rain in the area. By 5.40 p.m. on Sunday, June 25th, it was reported that the initial search party had discovered five bodies in the distant part of the Far Marathon West Passage, a short distance upstream from the junction with the Far Marathon East, which carries a small stream. Until that point, all official statements had consistently mentioned that there were five men in the missing party, with five names provided, and now five bodies had been discovered. The shock everyone experienced was suddenly interrupted by a report revealing that there were in fact six men in the party. It took some time to confirm this information definitively and determine the names of all six men. By this point at 6 p.m., the rescue party had been significantly depleted due to the extensive efforts made. Given the extremely remote likelihood of the six man having survived, it was decided to postpone further attempts to locate him and identify the bodies until Monday. Light rain had started to fall. Monday turned out to be a tough day. The dam had weakened due to heavy overnight rain. The weather forecast was unfavorable and underground telephone communications had failed. When teams eventually got underground, they faced a shortage of individuals familiar with the far reaches of the cave, leading to inefficiencies in manpower. Eventually, ongoing rain led to a hazardous increase in the water level behind the dam. The diversion channel, apparently not deep or wide enough to handle the heightened flow, prompted the withdrawal of all parties from the system by 5 p.m. On Tuesday, June 27th, there was an additional attempt to reinforce the diversion dam and the three excavators focused on this task throughout the morning, creating a structure approximately six feet high. Additional work was done on the secondary dams around the entrance enclosure. The focus had shifted from a rescue operation to one aimed at uncovering the fate of the six men, identifying the bodies that had been discovered, and either bringing them out or providing a respectful underground burial within the cavern. Once security was established, teams were sent to conduct a thorough search of the far reaches of the marathon series, aiming to locate the body of the six man, who it was speculated might have been carried deeper into the cave by high pressure waters. Around 2 p.m., Dave and Alan Brook, along with Dave Howitt from the ULSA and three others entered the cave. They reached the phone at knee record junction in approximately 50 minutes, and after three to four hours, they reported back that despite an intensive search of the distant parts of the cave, no sixth body had been found. While the identification of the five bodies had been accomplished, John Ogden had not been located. A third search party, led by Brian Boardman from CRO, entered the cave at 10 p.m with instructions to explore several smaller passages, branching off the near and far marathon passages. At 3.10 a.m. on Wednesday morning, Brian reported that, while examining the area where three of the bodies had been discovered, he believed he had located the body of John. It was wedged vertically in an extremely narrow rift, about 15 feet from the others, but was so covered in silt that only the boots, socks, laces, and part of the white helmet were visible. Brian couldn't get a closer look, but the details he observed matched the clothing known to be worn by John. Through a process of elimination, it was determined that John had also tragically drowned. It's believed that when the cavers heard the oncoming water, they were already stuck behind a 1.8-mile underground river rapidly filling the cavern. Unable to find an escape route, they climbed into a crack at the top of the cavern, but it could only accommodate one person. John Ogden managed to fit into the tight gap, but there was barely enough space. With no alternative, he remained there while his five friends drowned below. He endured this situation for six days until rescue teams located him, but sadly, it was too late. The tragedy was heartbreaking. Six out of 10 close friends, all highly experienced cavers, lost their lives suddenly and in terrifying circumstances. Over 300 individuals, including members of Leeds University and local caving clubs, participated in the effort to rescue the cavers. 
Coroner Stephen Brown delivered a verdict of misadventure and ordered the cave to be sealed as their final resting place, deeming any attempt to bring them to the surface too dangerous. Located on a secluded moorland between Wharfdale and Nidderdale, the cave entrance became a solemn sight. The men's bodies remained undisturbed for three years until a group of cavers breached the seal and relocated them to another chamber, naming it the Sanctuary. A plaque now commemorates the spot where British caving witnessed its darkest day. We would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting caving story.